And he went, oh yeah, women followed Jesus too. I forgot. Stories that people tell each other and how those prepare the way for us to receive the good news of Jesus into our life. So we join in our first hymn, Alleluia, Jesus is Risen. quick uh, service note. When we get to the prayers of the church, um, we've been praying for Joan Graham. Uh, we just sang what Joan experienced yesterday. Uh, Jesus is risen and we shall arise. Joan uh, left this veil of tears yesterday afternoon around five o'clock. I got to visit with her in the morning and share all the promises we have in the resurrection. So we rejoice with her that she is heavenly home and we uh, remember those who will be mourning her absence here on earth. With that in mind, please stand. We begin our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take this moment to privately confess any sins particularly troubling to us. Let us confess all our sins to God our Father. Almighty God, in his mercy, gave his Son to die for us, and for his sake he forgives us all our sins. So as a called and ordained servant of the word, it is my joyful duty to announce the full forgiveness of all of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Please.
please join me in singing our hymn of praise. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that we who have celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ may, by the help of your grace, live in awareness of your risen Son's presence and bring forth the fruits of faith in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated to hear from God's Word. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Psalms uh, 45, 9, and 10. O Lord my God, you have done great things, marvelous works, and your thoughts toward us. There is no one who compares to you. I will try to recite your actions, even though there are too many to number. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle today is found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was powerful at work in them all. This is the word of the Lord. In honor of the gospel, we stand and sing the Alleluia verse. Our gospel today is found in the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Coming to you, O Lord. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with him. 
but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that had happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And with what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the, all, all the scriptures concerning himself. And they approached the village to which they were going. And Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying... Oh, excuse me. Sorry. I got it. Three pages, and I didn't... That's okay. I thought I had it fixed. Pardon me. With us. For it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true! The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So this was the picture of the Emmaus Road disciples that I grew up with. Uh, It was hanging up, I don't remember where in our church, but this is is the account that I knew. Uh, The Emmaus Road disciples aren't quite sure yet as they walk along. And it says that when Jesus joins them, they don't recognize him at first. But in that process of dialogue, and then later on in the breaking of bread, then they figure it out. It takes them a little bit of time. But that's the kind of God we have. We have a God who says, if it takes you a little bit of time, I'll walk with you. We don't have a God who runs ahead of us and says, come on, catch up. And we don't have a God who says, I'm sorry, you can't keep up. You're not mine. We have a good shepherd. We have a good God. A God who walks with us as we figure things out and work on them. Would you please join me in singing our next hymn?
I think God gave us the account of the Emmaus disciples so we can understand for ourselves how Jesus' disciples, people like you and me, grow in our awareness of Jesus' presence in our life. It begins, like all things with God, with Jesus. It begins with Jesus coming to the disciples as they walk along. It says in the Bible, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Jesus always comes to us as we are. He doesn't wait until we've cleaned up. He doesn't wait until we fix things. He doesn't wait until we get our act together. Just like Jesus joined the Emmaus Road disciples in their sorrow as they walked along, he joins us in whatever it is we're working on. If you will, he takes us in as-is condition. This is the first bit of good news in the account of the Emmaus Road disciples. We don't have a God who stands up here and says, just get to me. We have a God who comes and walks alongside of us. Now, I've always been puzzled by that line that says, they were kept from recognizing him. And for years, I thought it was Jesus who did the keeping. I think probably I was influenced by watching various, you know, film adaptations of the life of Jesus. Because the directors are trying to figure out how do we do this scene, right? And I remember one where Jesus kind of pulled up the, the, the shawl on his hood and kind of blocked his face. So I always assumed that somehow, maybe by the crucifixion or by the resurrection, Jesus' appearance was somehow changed and his disciples just didn't recognize him because Jesus was kind of, well, hiding. But that really doesn't make sense in light of what we know from the rest of the scripture. Where God reveals himself and says, I am with you always. And I will not hide from you. We even have a theological term for this. We call it omnipresence. I mean, God is always present with us. So I don't think Jesus was somehow pretending. But this line makes sense to me. Their faces were downcast. And I forget all about the fact that I'm not alone. I understand the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Their faces were downcast. They were busy focused on what was broken and what was wrong. And as a result, they didn't see Jesus. But this story is designed, I think, to help us understand how close Jesus is to us. So what helped those Emmaus Road disciples finally recognize him? And what can we learn from it? How can we apply this to our life? What will it do to help us see Jesus? To understand that we are not alone, but that he is with us. Well, at the very end of the story, it says... When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Now, scholars have debated since this story was part of our Christian narrative, is this communion? Is Jesus breaking the bread like he did a few days earlier on Monday, Thursday, when he first instituted the Lord's Supper, what we now call communion? And we're going to let those scholars debate that. But some of those words certainly sound familiar. Took, bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave. I mean, those are the words we use in our communion liturgy. So we could say, yeah, this is, if not exactly the sacrament, it certainly is hinting at it. And that is one of the ways that God gives us a tangible way to remind ourselves that we are not alone, but that Jesus is present. When we take communion, when we receive the, the little bit of wafer, when we receive that sip of wine, we are reminded that our God who came to us in the flesh still comes to us. Now, it remains a mystery how all of this works, but we are not alone. When we receive the Lord's Supper, when we receive communion, Jesus says, I am here. We call this the real presence. It is one of the marks of a sacrament. 
that Jesus himself comes to us here. Now, that's one way that the disciples figure out Jesus is with them, that they come to see someone they couldn't see despite the fact that he was there. But it goes on, and, and they start talking to each other, and they say, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? It's one of the reasons churches push Bible study. Because we know when God's people get into God's word, we start to see God more. We start to realize his presence. We start to realize that we are not alone, but that he walks with us. So in our Lutheran language, we would say, oh, God's word and communion, word and sacrament. These are sure and tangible ways that we can be assured and remind ourselves that we are not alone, but that God is with us. To which we will say, this is most certainly true. But there is a third element in this story. And it gets lost. In fact, I've read this story again and again. I've preached on it for years. And it finally caught my attention this year. And it's the power of testimony. The power of one believer sharing their Jesus story with another. Here's how the Emmaus Road disciples describe it to Jesus while they're walking down the road. Some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. And then they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels and who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. This is the power of testimony. The power of people we know talking about the reality of God in their life. The women came back to, I'm guessing, the upper room or wherever the disciples were gathering and said, guys, we don't exactly know how to process this, but we went, but the tomb is empty, and there was an angel, and he said he's alive. And we know from reading other gospel narratives that Peter and John take off and run and go and see the empty tomb. And they come back and go, guys, we don't know what's going on, but this tomb is empty and we think maybe Jesus is alive. I think that power of testimony, that power of just believers sharing their experience with God, I think that's what gave the Emmaus Road disciples that little bit of hope that kept them going. So when Jesus shows up in the flesh and they're not yet ready to see him, they're still ready to engage with him. God has given us this gift, folks, the gift of testimony, the gift of sharing our Jesus stories designed to encourage and support our faith as we talk about the reality of God. Now, don't get me wrong. Word and sacrament, those are key and always essential. They always work. And testimony kind of gets forgotten. But I think testimony paves the way to word and sacrament. It is that little bit of encouragement that we give one another. I, it, it got forgotten. When the Emmaus Road disciples got back to Jerusalem were giving their report, they said, well, we figured it out when he broke the bread. And then, and then we said, oh, yes, and didn't our hearts burn when he explained the scriptures to us? They got word and sacrament. What they forgot about was the testimony. And that's the very nature of testimony. When we talk about our Jesus stories, it seems kind of ephemeral. It's not like a, a great big biblical miracle. It's just a little thing, a little nudge from God. Back before I discovered girls, I went fishing. I liked fishing. Um, I like girls better, so I stopped fishing. It, it, it wasn't a deal. It wasn't like, no, no, you can't do one or the other, but it's just, you know, time management. And I went, fish, girls, I'm sticking with girls. But before that point, I never had a New Testament miracle experience. I would throw out my line. Sometimes I would catch something. Sometimes I wouldn't catch anything. Sometimes I catch a lot of something. But you know what never happened to me? I never had Jesus show up on the shore and go, Hey, John, put your line down on the other side of the boat and catch 153 fish. 
That's a full-on biblical miracle. I have never experienced something like that. But what I have experienced is, well, just the nudges. Where somebody says, hey, I don't know for sure, but I think this is what God's doing in my life. I, I had this experience. I saw that. And they're not, they're not up at the bar of a high New Testament or Old Testament miracle. They're not there. They're just testimony. And that's why I think the Emmaus disciples forgot testimony. It was just, well, the women said this, and then a couple of the guys said that. But we don't quite know what to do with it. But it paved the way and escorted them into the presence of Jesus where they could finally see him. My brothers and sisters, God has given us Jesus stories. Our own experiences of God's reality in our life. And we get to share them. I'm not trying to say they're the same thing as what God says in the scriptures. I'm not trying to say they're anything like that. They're just those nudges, those hints. You see, what makes testimony work is the familiarity of it. Because a testimony comes from somebody we know, somebody we trust. We gives it that little bit of extra weight. That weight that helps us along and pushes us so that when Jesus shows up, we see him. Now, we know Jesus will always come in word and sacrament, but that testimony, those little stories, the stories of Jesus in our life, those are important too. Forgettable often, but oh so key. It says that Jesus came up while the Emmaus Road disciples were talking about what had just happened. They were talking about the Jesus stories they'd heard from the women and Peter and John, their companions. And they were trying to process it. And those stories paved the way for Jesus to be seen. Amen. Would you stand and join me in the words of the Nicene Creed? In our prayers today, we remember those who mourn the passing of Joan Graham. We also are praying for uh, Rhoda, and Jack Rhoda is having uh, part of her leg amputated today. We pray for her as she recovers, and for Jack as they figure out how to live and work together. And we also pray for Dennis Lutz as he's being treated for cancer. He's just running into some side effects from his treatment. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who mourn the passing of Joan. We thank you for the promises of resurrection, the promise that death is not the end for us. But for those of us who are left behind, this will be a sad and difficult time. So help us. 
to see you walking along with us, knowing that you too have experienced death and resurrection and want to help us. Father, we pray for Dennis as he struggles with his cancer treatments. Uh, surround him with people who can support and help him and as that continues. And we pray for uh, Karen's brother and his wife, Rhoda and Jack. We pray for uh, recovery for Rhoda and for help as they figure out their new normal. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, your word declares that we are to pray for those who are in positions of authority so that we might live peaceful and quiet lives. Therefore, we pray for Joseph Biden, the president of our nation, for Jared Polis, the governor of our state, for Matthew Harrison and James Maxwell, who lead our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and Rocky Mountain District. Father, for these men and for all the men and women whom you have entrusted with authority, bless them, Father. Bless them so they can lead well, so the people that they serve can live well. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, in our world, marred as it is by sin, we nevertheless pray for health and for justice and for peace. And we thank you for those men and women we know who have dedicated their life towards those goals. We remember Kathy and Shelley and Keith, Blake and Todd and Connor and Nick. In your word, O oh Lord, you declare that one generation is to commend your deeds to the next. We ask that you would bless us with the privilege of being a congregation that accomplishes that task. Help us, Father, to do this good and faithful work. Lord, in your mercy. It is with joy, Father, that we remember our friends in Cambodia and in Guatemala. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to support the work of Lutheran Bible translators. And we pray that you'd guide us into the next place where we can serve. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Father, we remember those who need a special measure of your grace in their life. We pray for Jill and Jeremy, for Cody and Brian and Mona, for Patricia and Sheila and Linda, for Ruth and Maureen, for Vicki and Diana, for Donna and Sean, for Carrie, Betty's friend Jerry, and her great-grandson Matthew, for Andrew and for Donald. Lord, in your mercy. It's into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we sing our offertory, remember this morning we remember that the offerings, whether you mail it in or electronically transport or drop it in the back box in back, those offerings not only support our ministry here, but they also go out into our community. We are a congregation that supports young life. Would you please join me in singing, Let the Vineyards Be Fruitful. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you 
Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on us, children of men, and have given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that he may establish in us a living faith, and prepare us to joyfully remember our Redeemer, and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Our Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Then in the same way also he took a cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, it is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Now may the peace of our Lord be with you always. Please be seated. Before we sing our Agnes Day, let's just go through the communion drill. I'll be the first person you'll come to. I'll have the bread, the host. If you have a gluten allergy, I keep some gluten-free wafers. Please let me know. Behind me will be one of our elders holding the chalice. This is probably like the cup that Jesus used in the upper room with his disciples for those of you who want that one cup experience. Behind him will be another one of our elders holding the tray with the individual glasses. If you have an allergy to alcohol, um, the row closest to the elder is always our non-alcoholic option. Um, they're, they're, um, if you're not feeling steady on your feet, I will look for you and bring you communion just before we finish. And once again, folks, we are a church that takes God's word seriously. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, St. Paul says that it's entirely possible that if you do not recognize the body of Christ, you can eat and drink judgment on yourself. So if you're not yet a believer, if you haven't been instructed in the Lord's Supper, um, this isn't for you yet because it might do you harm. You're welcome to come forward and let me give you a blessing instead. With all that covered, would you please join me in singing our Agnus Day while our elders come forward.
Please stand. May this body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Please join me in singing our post-communion canticle. pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this good gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, both in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Please be seated and join me in our final hymn. few announcements. First off, thanks to all of you. Uh, the Easter celebration we got to have here was wonderful because everybody that worked together and made it happen. Uh, everything from our young people with the egg hunt to our men serving breakfast. Uh, it's fun to be part of a place where everybody rolls up their sleeves, pitches in, makes things happen. Uh, other good news we get to give thanks for, we look like we're going to be resuming our altar guild. Um, there's an altar guild meeting that's going to happen on Saturday the 20th at 10 a.m. If uh, you were like, ooh, I wanted to say yes, I want to help with that, uh, Dan Magyar in back would love to talk with you. And if you don't know who he is, when we're doing the handshake line, I'll send you to him because he would love to get you involved on that. One of the other things I love about Christ our Savior is that we understand that no one of us is as smart as all of us. So in our Thursday uh, chat and chew, 
um, we were talking about what should we do for our next topic. And Karen just said, well, let's ask everybody who comes. What are the areas in your life that you would like some help with? And one of the things that floated up with was, I need help with conversational skills with my friends who are starting to have some memory issues. How do I get better at having those conversations? So we have some people that are already pulling resources together. Somebody else, I forgot what the other one was. I haven't written down in my office. I haven't forgotten them. But if you're part of that group and you weren't there for that dialogue uh, and you have an idea, um, come talk to me. Now I'm going to give you a heads up. This is Christ our Savior. This is not a, I have a great idea for somebody else to do. Uh, this could be a, I have a great idea and I want to be part of the solution. So let me know on that. Uh, chosen this Tuesday, 7 o'clock. All right. Choir Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Very good. Women's Bible study Friday at 9.30. All right. Um, hey, bad news on our building front. One of our air conditioners died. Uh, you wouldn't know it today, um, but we started to test them. And you, know, you put something in and like 24 years later, it dies. <laughs> I tell you. Um, so anyhow, uh, that's going to be something we're going to be dealing with. We think we have all the funds. We've been putting money aside because, well, you've heard that god-awful noise it was making when you'd walk in from the parking lot. We knew it was coming, and, and it has finally given up the ghost. Um, today in Sunday School, we're going to do one of the post-resurrection narratives that doesn't involve Jesus. Uh, we're going to look at the report of the guards and that little bit that Matthew includes where they, the, the guards who uh, you know, were guarding the tomb of Jesus uh, have to show up to the Sanhedrin and go, I, uh, the tomb's empty, um, angels, earthquakes, um, and how they... Uh, so it's one of the first stories of you know, the cover-up. Uh, so that'll be happening downstairs for the adults when you hear the big heavy bell that's joining me when you hear the little tinkling bell that's for Karen and the kids to head down to Sunday school I think that's it for announcements unless I'm missing something we're going to depart in God's grace we're going to live in his peace amen <laughs>